My name is Sophia Savick and I'm the Director of Membership and Development here at Philanthropy Impact and the moderator for this series, which has been established to support you, the trusted professional advisors, in giving your clients best practical advice, both in philanthropy journeys and their purpose-driven wealth strategies. We know that it's important that you are empowered with knowledge for your clients, but that you also understand when to signpost to and where to find trusted partners and experts in this field. I'm on hand to help you make the most of your membership with us. Do get in, chat in the chat, uh, get in touch in the chat today. Um, or my email is available at the end of the session if you're watching on YouTube. Um, so the session we're talking about today is Arts and Culture Philanthropy and Will Philanthropists Save the Arts? As always, we'll be keeping this session to strictly 30 minutes. If you, um, We do encourage you to use the chat to introduce yourself, share your LinkedIn, make comments and also post questions you may have for our speakers. This leads me to introduce our chair for today, Claire Titley, who's the director, I hope I said that right, sorry, director at Philanthropy at Arts Council and joining Claire, we warmly welcome Suzanne Marriott, who's the partner and notary public for and on behalf of Charles Russell Speechley's and Oxfam. I deliver. Not, not Oxfam. Not, where has that come from? I don't know where Oxfam came <laughs> from. I, do you know, I feel like I'm being sabotaged today. Um, I deliver is <laughs> consulting on policy strategy and governance at Two Rivers Associates Limited and is also policy lead expert and non executive director on the board of the UK Impact Investing Institute. And finally, we welcome Anna Rowe, a consultant who specialises in strategy and business planning to underpin the sustainable development of arts organisations. Thank you all for joining today. And I'll hand over to you now, Claire, to make a start. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Um, I'm really pleased to be chairing this afternoon session. We have, as um, Zofia said, a range of panel members joining us, bringing a real wealth and depth of experience and specialisms um, for this discussion on arts and philanthropy. Um, I'd like to introduce Su Suzanne um, to, to say a few words of introduction. Um, and also other panel members. But, but before I, I do that, um, I just wanted to um, sort of provide some reflections on um, the role of Arts Council in, in this space. Um, and at Arts Council, we believe that great art and culture inspires us, brings us together and teaches us about ourselves and the world around us. And in short, it makes life better. We champion, develop and invest in artistic and cultural experiences that enrich people's lives um, from theatre to digital art, reading to dance, music to literature and crafts and collections. And we invest public money uh, from government and the National Lottery to help create these experiences for as many people as possible across the country. Now, Arts Council is committed to supporting the sector to get better at raising money from private sources. And our work in this area is strategically aligned with our current delivery plan, which highlights one of our key outcomes, which is fit for the future cultural sector. And when we talk about philanthropy, we're talking about it in, in the broad, um, broadest of terms, um, from traditional philanthropy to um, more recently, the impact investing social investment space. Um, and the panel members have a wealth of experience across these areas. We absolutely believe in the importance of the mixed model of funding. So one where public funding provides a bedrock of support and philanthropy and earned income help the sector to build greater resilience, helping the sector to thrive and deliver even greater artistic ambition. And earlier this month, Arts Council, together with AEA Consulting, published our latest private investment in culture survey. And um, I believe that if, if not already, it, it will be posted in the chat, a link to that survey or um, on the website of Philanthropy Impact. But that survey really provides a snapshot of income, of where income is for the arts and cultural sector at the moment from individuals, trusts and foundations and companies over the last three years. And it actually takes us up until 20, end of March 2021. So despite the disruptions caused by the pandemic and other macro social economic events, income remained relatively stable with just under 800 million being committed to the sector in 2021. Now, authors of the report noted a 3% reduction in private giving over the course of that year, which obviously is to be expected given the volatility in the charitable income. 
And also given where arts and cultural organisations activity is predicate, predicated on bringing people together for shared experiences, um, which of course stopped during lockdowns and restrictions. But what the findings seem to suggest is that the arts and culture sector found a significant level of loyalty from its existing donors. And many were able to adapt and flex their approaches to experiment with digital fundraising tools and increase their web presence to generate increased donations. The most significant area of support is absolutely from individuals, 44% followed by um, trusts and foundations and companies coming in at 15%. Whilst there is optimism for growing greater levels of philanthropy, there are also concerns about the capacity within arts and cultural organisations to continue fundraising effectively. And the concentration of private investment in particular areas and types of organisations. So that's to set um, a, a landscape, if you like, for the, for the conversation and discussion that we've got today. 30 minutes isn't long, and I'm hoping that we'll come to each member of the panel um, to share their thoughts, insights and experience um, and have a great discussion. Um, so I just wanted to come to Anna first, um, and perhaps this is a good opportunity for you to I I express um, greater introduction as well but um, as a consultant working across the arts and cult cultural sector do these findings correlate with your experience? Thank you Claire and yes they absolutely do um, just by way of introduction as Sophia said I'm a consultant I work with arts organisations across different genres um, looking at building sustainable business models um, but one of my big initiatives as it says in my my label here is I've been um, needing a new initiative around um, increasing level of arts um, philanthropy across the whole arts and culture sector, working with Claire. Um, I mean, one of my observations is, of course, over the past couple of years, there was a huge loss or a huge change in business model for arts organisations. As Claire said, um, it's very much about the arts rely on bringing people together for performances to exhibitions, and all of that was shut off. Um, and with the best will in the world, it wasn't possible to replicate or replace all of that lost ticket income and earned revenue straight away with other earned income. Now, fortunately, the government stepped in with the Cultural Recovery Fund, which was extremely helpful. Um, but arts organisations actually have been very good at retaining their donors, such that in many cases, arts organisations continue to receive those annual contributions, even in a year when um, arts and culture activity was much diminished. Um, I guess if the pandemic had gone on for a significantly longer time, not that I've just declared it over, but if there had been many more years of that, I guess it would have been increasingly difficult to retain those relations. So it'll be interesting to see what the data shows in the next survey. One other um, observation I would make is that many people buy tickets for arts events long before the event takes place. And one of the trends that we've seen um, uh, is the creation of a whole new load of arts philanthropists or arts supporters who, when the pandemic came, were willing to transfer the ticket money that they'd um, given the arts organisations for a ticket into a donation to that arts organisation. I think that's one of the reasons why the level of income has been sustained even while earned income has fallen. Thank, thank you, Anna. Ida, um, uh, uh, thank you very much for join, joining, particularly as I gather you're on, on holiday. So thank you for sparing time, time to join us. I mean, given your experience, and maybe again, you use this as an opportunity to introduce your your background. But what do you see um, as the as the main main trends, and and how can you how do you see investors and philanthropists can make a difference in this space? Well, thank you very much. Um, arts and culture are something very very um, important to me in my life. And I have a real passion for um, figuring out ways that we can bring more of the arts into the day-to-day -day lives of more people. Um, I come at this from a number of different angles. Um, I'm a trustee of Royal Academy of Dance. I chair their development committee. Um, I'm also a trustee of Dancers Career Development, which helps dancers when they um, move on to other careers and to prepare themselves uh, to do so. Um, I'm on the board, I just 
joined the board of the Maria Bjornsson Memorial Fund, working with one of Suzanne's partners um, on that board. And I also, um, I'm on the board of a, a, a very small charity that makes uh, donations to art or, or gives grants to artists to um, allow them to take sabbaticals. Um, so I have that angle as well as the policy angle. And I'm the daughter of visual artists. So I grew up um, with a Cubist mother, a sculptor, and a, a father who was a painter and uh, took ballet for eight years as, as a child. So I had a lot of culture in my life as I was growing up. So what, what do I think the trends? I mean, you've already said, um, I thought the report was absolutely excellent. The culture survey report and made very interesting reading. Um, you've already said that uh, on the uh, philanthropy side, it stayed pretty constant, and that would be uh, that that would sort of hold with my um, my experience. Um, in fact, I think some of us actually gave more. Um, we we wanted to keep those organizations that we support afloat, and um, were were extremely. I think there were many, many people in the UK who gave very generously. Um, I think um, what was really interesting to me was that the corporates um, reduced their, their giving or their support, their sponsorship. And I think that is an area where we really need to do some work perhaps, and also to find new ways for uh, charities and arts organizations to generate revenues, because that was another area that went down. And I'm really interested in the concept of place-based impact investment. Uh, we've done much work on this at the Impact Investing Institute. It's one of our highest priority projects. And I'd, I'd love to see ways that arts organizations can come together to help communities and to bring that um, cohesion um, into communities, because I think they can, and they add something really special and, 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 and bring a spirit uh, that can, can really help. I think also very relevant to the leveling up agenda and building uh, underserved communities. That, that's really helpful, Ida, and maybe we'll we'll come back to that if, if we've got time to talk talk a little bit more. I mean, certainly in Arts Council's experience, we we believe that creativity and culture have the power to act as that catalyst to local economies, bringing communities together, um, and and making lives better. I mean, Suzanne, obviously you're you're working and your experience working with um, private clients and and in that sort of service um, advisor space. Um, can you share some thoughts based on your experience of what you think um, the, the sort of professional advisors have to offer in this space? Yes, I've certainly seen an uptick in being asked to be on boards for arts charities because I think um, something the pandemic really showed us was how important sort of good governance was to make organisations um, continue in a profitable way. And I think the professional advisor, there's always been a role for them within cultural spaces, but I think um, the expertise that some of them could bring, I mean, most boards sometimes lack having any expertise other than the arts expertise. And sometimes that can be a failing. Obviously it's an incredibly important part, but often you do need somebody who's got an accounting background or a legal background or even a property background, depending on what your um, charity does and what it owns in terms of its assets. Sets. And I think that also professional advisors can be really useful as being chairs of boards because they're very used to that. I mean, I do quite a bit of litigation as well within the art space, and it's, it's quite important having independent people to, to be able to chair meetings and also negotiating things like complicated loans and borrowings and mortgages and things that a lot of arts charities have had to enter into in order to keep going during this period. And I think the third thing is probably professionals can sometimes introduce to other groups of people 
that is completely outside the space of the other board members because they have a wider network in different areas and different um, expertise areas as well. And that can introduce particularly individuals, but also other foundations and businesses as well, who might be interested in the arts organization because of geography, because of fit with culture, or for whatever other reason that they can make a connection. That's really helpful, thank you. I mean, certainly I think there's there's also, the, the cultural sector has benefited massively from tax reliefs as well, and thinking about orchestra tax reliefs, some museums and gallery, um, gift aid is, is, is a tax, tax relief. Do you think there, there could be a greater role from the professional advisor sector to um, signposting individuals to, to the benefits of, of these? Yes, always. I mean, obviously, the big charities know about them. They're very well publicised and the government's actually pretty good. And the Arts Council is very good at making those very clear. I think um, smaller new organisations are sometimes very unaware of how they work, particularly when they want to do things overseas. You know, if they want to do any tie up with America or Europe, I think that's an area where it becomes quite complicated and there's a lot of misinformation there. So again, that's something that a professional advisor is key to, to trying to help with that. Yeah, and you, you mentioned the scale of organisations and particularly those small to medium sized ones, because that's a real challenge, I think, for the sector. You know, you have some significant organisations that have, you know, vast development departments that are able to engage lots of donors and, and have lots of relationships. And, and then you have smaller organisations which tend to go down the trust and foundation route because that's an easier, um, easier sort of uh, area for them to invest in. Um, Anna, just thinking about actually the work that some of the work that you've been doing outside of London, because the, the private investment in culture survey, one of the findings is that, you know, 65 percent of all income raised by arts and cultural organisations is in London, which is what you would expect, given that that's where, you know, the, the centre of the capital of kind of wealth is generated largely in, in the, the capital. But in terms of how do we support the sector to um, to engage with individuals outside of London? You know, there's some fun. You know, there there are a, a huge wealth of organisations. And ha and can you talk about some of the work that you've been doing in that space? Yes. So you're absolutely right. And to pick up Suzanne's um, point that smaller organisations are not familiar, um, perhaps as large organisations are with things like gift aid. I mean, I suppose in my experience, I would say that many of the small organisations haven't got to the point where they need to know about gift aid because they're not engaging with individuals who are making donations to which gift aid would apply. Um, and so it's worth interrogating why that is. Um, that often if you travel outside of the southeast, you you hear um, arts organisers say, well, it's different here or there isn't the same level of wealth here or it's not the dumb thing to ask people for money here. We apply. We have funding from. Um, government, um, either central or local. And it's also the case that board members of, of arts organisations that I've encountered, at, you know, in different areas across the country are not engaged with the role of either giving money to the organisation on whose boards they sit, or indeed in um, inviting their contacts and friends to contribute, which is a very tried and trusted route in, in the southeast. Um, the other area, of course, is resourcing. If you find a small organisation, a new organisation, as Suzanne said, perhaps one which has been set up by an artist, arts organisations often set up, you know, they start on someone's kitchen table, you ask your friends and family members to support, you apply to the Arts Council or Trusts and Foundations for money, and you put on some projects, and then you look around and you think, well, actually, how am I going to grow the capacity of this organisation? But you've not necessarily set yourself up in such a way that you have access to those individuals or the resources on your staff to be able to do that. And so one of the things that we've done at New Philanthropy for Arts and Culture, if we've created a toolkit to help um, small arts organisations engage in this space in the first instance. So our website is artsphilanthropy.org and we can put that into the chat as well. Um, but the idea is to create, um, to create resources, as you say, Claire, to enable some of the smaller organisations just to engage with issues as to how do you find supporters, how do you engage with them, how do you create a case for support, how do you steward them, and what the various rules are that Suzanne alluded to earlier on. 
And that's not to say that small organisations aren't performing in this space, because we know, you know, some organisations are working incredibly hard in this space and, and have developed some brilliant, fantastic relationships. I mean, in, in anybody's, um, so in terms of um, all, all panel members, uh, how, how do you, um, how could we bring scale to, to some of these innovative approaches? So you, Anna, you talked about working in, in, in some places, but um, how do you think we can build on some of the really good examples that are happening where organisations are engaging philanthropists, whether that's in traditional forms of philanthropy or in impact investing space? Are there any ideas for, for how we can... Some of the things that come to mind straight, straight away, um, there was a few years ago the absolutely wonderful Arts Council Catalyst programme which helped arts organisations across the country to increase their resources in fundraising um, and had a whole series of match funding programmes which were really instrumental in bringing new donors into some of those organisations. So I see various parallels in that programme which was highly effective and ways that could support arts organisations going forward. Um, and then along, alongside that, um, you know, some of the training programmes um, Cause 4, who's again one of the Arts Council partner organisations, they do excellent training programmes for some of these smaller organisations to expose them, to give them the skills. And as you say, Claire, of course, it's not to say that all small arts organisations are naive in this space, but some way of sort of increasing capacity, increasing skill set to take the most of the opportunities that are there. Thank you, Anna. Ida, you, did you want to come in? Yeah, I did. Um, I think that um, a way forward on scale is to focus on projects. And um, I think that plays into place-based impact investing. It also plays into philanthropy and, and fundraising. And for instance, on the philanthropy side, I find that me, I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about dance and ballet, uh, being brought in as part of a syndicate for a new ballet is so, rewarding. Uh, you feel like you've really helped create something. You go to the rehearsals, you get a, an insight into um, how the choreographer works. It's a real, uh, it's a money can't buy experience. It is just so fabulous. So I think that focus on projects uh, can be really interesting in the ph philanthropy space, but also there are I, I think you can combine arts and culture with more commercial attributes and, and, and big projects. In fact, Royal Academy of Dance, um, our new headquarters are part of a, a, a new uh, block of flats. Um, and I, I think arts can bring a luster and, and help, um, and, and, and help crowd in private finance. And I, I think that's a very important uh, aspect to this. I should say on, on the point of boards and bringing in new skills, I'm actually a lawyer. I was a partner at a law, law firm and then a general counsel at a fund manager for many years. Um, um, but I, I, I think that getting those new networks in is really important. Uh, Suzanne made the point that professionals have networks. And I wish when I was practicing law and when I was um, more involved in my executive career, I had had an opportunity to create that balance in my life by getting more involved in the arts. And I think that's why I'm such a passionate advocate at the moment because it really makes a difference to people. And I think more people should get involved and they would find their lives really very much enriched. Your, your passion absolutely comes through, Ida. Um, th thank you for your comments. Um, I, I was just going to turn to Suzanne, thinking about how, or Ida sort of referenced the syndicate model in terms of bringing individuals together for a new production, or, or um, and and the the sort of access that that gains an individual. Is, is this something, Suzanne, you see in, if we think about the next generation of, of um, potential donors, supporters for arts and culture, is this something that they're interested in or, or are you seeing um, sort of different um, causes or different ways of engaging? 
definitely. I mean, I think there's two camps. I mean, there always used to be the people who used to like being named and they wanted to have something that had their name on it. And we still see a lot of that, but there's a lot more of people who don't want to be named and they want to just do it privately but they want to make a real difference and I think the key thing that that Ida mentioned which I see a lot of is that charities that really succeed in fundraising provide things that as Ida said that money can't buy so it's the experience, it's the access, it's the wh whatever it is that they have within either their collection or their building or their performance or the people who work for them or who donate to them. It gives people access to those people and that's something they can't get other than if they join at a certain level of a patron membership or they buy a ticket for a certain event that gives them that, or, or they have some other means of, of doing that. And I think that's really important for, for particularly the younger generation. They, they want to see value for their money, for their donation, but not in a way that just sees their name in light. And I also think that the things that I'm seeing with the next gen of, of donors approaching philanthropy is, is very much about obviously sustainability, diversity and particularly mental health and I think the lockdowns really made people realize how important the visual arts are to individuals and to families and to people and I think people are actually really wanting to make sure those those arts organizations continue but in a way which serves also the things that they value in society like making sure that people have good mental health making sure that it is sustainable and it is very diverse Absolutely. Thank you, Suzanne. I'm conscious that John's appeared on the screen, which means that we are, are drawing um, to, to an end of, of the time that we've got available. We could talk for so much longer. Um, I'm very conscious that John might invite you to sort of um, conclude um, in a moment. But I just wondered in your conclusions, if there are organisations that you would um, like to um, sort of, in your view, are really demonstrating sort of um, best practice in these areas, then um, this is your opportunity to, to reference them. Um, is that what you, <laughs> will you ask, invite the panel to, to make some closing statements, John? Okay, yeah, Claire, thank you very much. Um, and uh, I'd ask Suzanne, that was brilliant and clearly did a super job chairing. Um, very complex topic, very important topic. 30 minutes is hardly scratching the surface. So we might take a, a, a look at doing a much longer version of this sometime later this year, early next year, because it's so important. Um, a couple of, of things. Um, um, the role of professional advisors is really quite important in this and supporting their clients on their donor journey. And uh, we run specialized uh, fundraising because you were talking about that fundraising training for major donors on how to work with professional advisors as trusted partners um, because they do um, uh, uh, to a certain extent turn off some uh, uh, advisors uh, in the approach they take. So we, we have a specialized training program for them. Um, the other thing is that if, if you're going to, I'm going to ask you to second uh, 30 seconds of uh, final words of wisdom you can name. So, uh, uh, Claire, I'm going to name one. Um, I think that there's a number of exemplars out there, and one of them is Live Theatre in Newcastle. Um, and uh, they're brilliant what they do um, around uh, taking intellectual capital, diversifying their revenue. So, they're just not looking at traditional sources of revenue. Um, and I was pleased to be the, one of the consultants that helped them th through that whole process. So if, if anyone wants to learn more about that, I'm happy to share. So um, uh, final words of wisdom, um, uh, 30 seconds. Um, uh, Anna, you can start. Thank you, John. Um, so I suppose I would um, pick the um, shining examples in arts um, practice which have impact on health and well-being. And to name two, English National Ballet has a wonderful programme called Dance for Parkinson's, which um, provides workshops and movement for people suffering from Parkinson's. It improves people's um, uh, stability and uh, balance and gives them confidence to go out. And alongside that, the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra has a fantastic stroke, which is music workshops for people who've suffered from stroke. Um, and wouldn't it be wonderful if everybody with Parkinson's or everyone with a stroke was able to benefit from those interventions, which are necessarily at the moment fairly small scale. 
Great, thank you. We're out of time, but uh, I'm going to use my um, authority uh, uh, to continue this and we'll continue recording because it's really important that they get your points across. Suzanne, over to you. I think for me, I'm a lawyer, so as a professional advisor, I would always say that organizations that have really concentrated on their governance and their compliance um, have done really well. And, and I think that, and there are also organizations that have really reached out to the regions because they sort of, they've had to during lockdown and now they're trying to continue that. And I think, look at the National Gallery this week announcing that they're going to lend out their collection around the whole country, which is fantastic. They would probably never have done that before. And yes, it's an anniversary, but it's, it's really taught them that they need to engage more with people all around the country. And, and I think that leveling up thing of, of making sure that everybody has access to the same quality of arts is very important. Great, thank you. Ida, um, um, final words to you of wisdom, please. Sure, I'm gonna come at this from a different angle um, and talk about two organizations that are helping show impact because it's really important to have the evidence and it's not always that easy to collect the evidence and present it in a meaningful way. So the first one is artists. And I, I also support a charity called Pro Bono Economics, uh, which brings government economists into the charitable world and they help the charities show impact. And artists and PBE have done some really excellent work on um, the positive outcomes of um, arts in primary schools. And um, they, according to the work, and this is government economists uh, who have been repurposed, uh, for every one pound spent uh, in artists' program uh, in, in primary schools, there could be as much as 32 pounds in return in long-term benefits in areas such as cognitive skills, IQ, self-esteem, reading, language, writing, subject learning behavior, um, uh, reducing truancy and uh, greater income in other lives. So I think that's really inspiring. There's also what works well-being, going back to the well-being topic and Nancy Hay, and they've done um, some really great work on uh, music and singing, visual art, dance, and heritage, and the positive impact on well-being. All very um, well thought through and evidenced. So those are my two standouts. Okay, great, Ada. Ida. Um, Claire, final word to you, and remember your rule, you can't mention any organizations other than philanthropy impact. <laughs> Yeah, so um, just to briefly explain, Arts Council is going through its um, investment process at the moment, which um, will uh, determine which organisations are receiving core support for the next three years. And as a result of that, um, we're, we're limited in what we can and can't say about organisations. So I've left it to the panel to determine in their opinions what, what are good examples. Um, I just wanted to thank all panel members for, for their interest and insights and experience and sharing, sharing that with um, the audience today. Um, it's been a real pleasure and I could talk for a lot longer in this, in this area, of course. So happy to come back and, and chair another session in the autumn or something um, when we can share more examples of um, organisations doing great work. Thank you, Claire. That was wonderful. Thanks for doing thank such you. a great job. Uh, Zofia, over to you. Yeah, just to echo Claire, thank you all so much for your time. Um, we will be doing something around the arts philanthropy in autumn, much bigger events, so I'll let you know when that's happening. We, with the Walk in My Shoes, we have one more before we take a short break for the summer, um, so look out for your invites. I think that's everything I had to say, but great chat. Thank you all very much. And also, 